What in the hell is a neural engine? If you bought an iPhone or iPad after 2017 or an Apple Silicon Mac, it has the neural engine. I assume the majority of my GigaChat audience already knows what machine learning is, so I'll speed run an explanation. This video will feature quite a bit of clips because animating ML is not easy. The short answer to my rhetorical question is that a &E was initially designed for machine learning processes like Face ID and Memoji on iOS, remember those, which debuted on the iPhone 10 with the A11 chipset. Machine learning uses the power of algorithms and statistical models that enable computers to perform tasks without explicit instructions. Machine learning learns to make predictions or decisions based on data, known as training. The learning process generally involves feeding large amounts of data into the algorithm, allowing it to learn and improve its accuracy over time. It varies a lot, and training can take on many forms, like using tagged data or unsupervised learning or neural networks. Fun side note, when LLMs are stealing the entire collected copyrighted materials of humanity by AI bros to replace human creativity, they use a mixture of unsupervised and supervised fine-tuning and later human reinforcement. What I'm saying is machine learning can use many techniques to replace humans. Machine learning is used in mundane tasks like email filtering to catch spam or exciting things like computer vision, such as the ability to identify objects in photos. With the AI Choo Choo Express hype train in full gear, wait, would AI be a hyperloop train? Nah. It's been about two years since I bought a Ugreen 3-port GAN charger with my own money. It's been my default packable charger and has gone with me on several adventures, including Europe. I even made a video review about the charger. I've been on YouTube for three years and never done a sponsor segment until today. And that's because it's finally a product I can recommend. This is the Ugreen Nexode Pro 160-watt 4-port GAN fast charger. It's an absolute monster in a tiny form factor. It has four ports and yet is somehow smaller than my 3-port 160 40 watt charger and my other 140 watt charger. All these chargers are GAN technology, but this is the smallest of the GAN ones. This little charger can simultaneously charge three laptops at once and an iPhone. Of course, this is an absurd demonstration, but it works well for my travel needs as I can charge my laptop, phone, watch, and battery all at once. It can deliver up to 140 watts off a single port to charge a MacBook Pro to 50% in 27 minutes. It uses Ugreen's Thermal Guard Protection System 2.0 to protect your devices from short circuit, over voltage, over temperature, and over current. The TLDR is if you're looking for a compact, high wattage multi charger, I can't recommend this one enough. Links and information are in the description. Thanks again to you green for sponsoring this segment now back to the video a lot of machine learning and neural networks are being rebranded as ai Machine learning requires a lot of computing power, and CPUs are not the most efficient at machine learning. For example, GPUs are parallel processors that can execute millions of certain math operations in a single clock cycle. Thus, they are much better suited for the needs of machine learning and why Jensen Wong can afford leather jackets. Apple designed its Apple Neural Engine, or a &E, to supplement certain types of machine learning tasks, such as training and executing using Core ML. It's important to understand Core ML, Apple's machine learning API, and it doesn't exclusively use the AE. It leverages the CPU, GPU, and if present, the AE. Rather than paraphrase, I'm going to quote Apple directly. Core ML then seamlessly blends the CPU, GPU, and AE, if available, to create the most effective hybrid execution plan exploiting all available engines on a given device. It lets a wide range of implementations of the same model architecture to benefit from the AE, even if the entire execution cannot take place there due to the idiosyncrasies of different implementations. So yeah, that means that Core ML will automatically use all the tools it has available. This is done so developers don't have to worry about various hardware configurations. If you're using Core ML, you're likely getting the best performance regardless of the device the tasks are being executed on. Unlike, say, a GPU, there is no public framework for directly programming on the a &E. It's hard for developers to benchmark the a &E. Apple has provided some graphs, and it has stated that the M1's neural engine could perform up to 11 trillion operations per second, the M2 and M3's neural engine can process up to 15.8 trillion operations per second, and M4 can do 38 trillion operations per second. The a &E is not just an accelerator for floating point math, it's better thought of as a low power consumption optimizer as it can be leveraged for certain types of ML tasks. For the real nerds out there, the a &E only really appears to support FP16 or 16-bit operations, and not even really 8-bit. And I'm not the guy to explain quantization. I'm going to just link to a GitHub project that's attempting to document 
the a and &E. While editing this and having a beer, I realized we really need to talk about flowing points for just a minute. Okay, without going too deep into computer science, one bit can store two values, two bits can store four values, three bits can store eight, and so on. 16 bit can store about 65,000 values, and 32 bit can store 4 billion. For non-whole numbers, ones with decimal points, you need to express where the decimal point is. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 could be 12.345678 or 123,456.78. A flowing point format is used to handle this by specifying the decimal's position. This involves components like the mantissa and exponent, but in essence, it allows the number to float where the decimal is needed. In machine learning, different bit depths are used, and 16-bit flowing point or FP16 is popular because it offers a reasonable balance of accuracy, memory usage, and processing power. Higher bit depth models can be quantized, say, from 32-bit to 16-bit, training some accuracy for performance. This is similar to downsampling a 24-bit image to 8-bit. What I'm trying to say is the A&E can only be used for a subset of operations. Now back to why we use the neural engine. It's faster, uses much less memory, less power, allowing for on-device execution of machine learning tasks. The a &E is not unique to Apple, and it's generally considered a Neural Processing Unit, or MPU. Neural processors can be found in the AI Engine and Qualcomm Snapdragons, the MPU in Samsung's Exynos, or the DaVinci MPU in Huawei's Kirin. The Studio View probably saw a pattern with all these, and that is they are ARM-based. x86 thus far hasn't relied on MPUs because dedicated GPUs are just really powerful and historically are less concerned with power consumption. If you remember from earlier, the M4 can do 38 trillion operations per second, but high-end NVIDIA GPUs can hit 1,300 trillion operations per second. This is why by the time you watch this, there's a good chance that NVIDIA is the world's most valuable company. With that kind of money, I'm sure Jensen Wong can afford a second leather jacket. Another reason that MPUs aren't typically found on x86 are the type of AI tasks that MPUs really excel at, like facial recognition, and computational photography, which doesn't really exist on desktop computers. Also, for really serious AI tasks like model training, it's often more effective to buy really expensive GPUs or lease computer time on cloud services with hardware acceleration. We are seeing feature creep on desktops. Windows 11 Copilot Plus requires 40 trillion operations per second. I figure I should interrupt myself. As much as I want to talk about Copilot Plus, it's a rapidly evolving situation, and Microsoft is changing it based on user feedback because it's abysmally bad. I suggest just googling it and reading up on it if you want to know more. For a spyware feature that takes screenshots at intervals, and I guess it lets you search them because we're at the slap blockchain, I mean <laughs> AI, onto everything and hope it gooses your stock valuation. According to FactSet, 117 S&P 500 companies mentioned AI in their first quarter earnings reports, and 177 S&P companies mentioned the term on their second quarter earnings calls. On top of that, the companies that mentioned AI outperformed the companies that did not. If you don't know Patrick Boyle, this is what his channel's about. So yeah, it's rap music going forward, and I'll try and cover the goings on in rap music and any beefs that might happen. Highly recommended financial slash hip hop news channel. To come back to the A&E and what the hell it's used for, I have a good example. Core ML is the foundation of Apple's computational photography. As everyone hopefully is aware today, when you snap a photo, there's no longer anything such as no filters, and billions of operations are performed to produce the image. From everything like face detection, color balancing, noise reduction, smart HDR, video stabilization, emulating the depth and focus of a camera in cinema mode, and scene analysis. The a and &E is a critical part of this chain. These are incredibly dense operations like scene analysis, which might sound simple, but Apple developed an entire ecosystem called the Apple Neural Scene Analyzer, or ANSA. This is the backbone of many features like in the Photos app, Memories, where the images are tagged, aesthetics are evaluated, detection is done for duplicates or near duplicates of photos, objects are detected, and locations are grouped. This is all done on device using another principle that Apple calls differential privacy, where Photos learns about significant people, places, and events to create memories while protecting the anonymity of its users. Exploring how Apple's memories work should be a video in itself. While this feature does not make extensive use of machine learning, it's not dependent on the a and &E alone. Instead, it assists in performing the analytics. So if you picked up by now, I've been talking more about Core ML than the a and &E, and that's quite frankly due to the lack of information 
version Apple has published. You can find frustrated developers complaining about the lack of info. While I am a developer and I have made a Mac app, I have to stress that machine learning is not my specialty, nor do I use PyTorch. While you personally might find it riveting to watch me execute Python scripts to see if the neural engine is engaging, I can assure you that most of YouTube does not. That is unless you're Alex Zakin, in that case you'd probably get 100k views off that video. The TLDR is the neural engine is a on-device neural processing unit, part of Apple Silicon that is leveraged for machine learning along with the CPU and GPU. It's very good for certain types of math operations and is partially a power saving mechanism designed to assist low powered computing rather than utilizing a much more power hungry GPU. This is especially the case with the Apple Watch, which needs to be ultra efficient. The Apple Watch line since the Series 4 has included a stripped down neural engine to assist with faster on-device processing of inputs. In Apple's marketing material for the Series 9 Apple Watch, Apple suggests that the neural engine is even used for the double tap gesture. This year's WWDC was very focused on Apple intelligence, Apple's branding for AI, a term that increasingly just gets obfuscated day by day. Apple plans to bring AI on multiple fronts, running local AI models and upchaining requests to the cloud when local is not enough. There are a lot of questions to be answered on how well this strategy will work, and perhaps by the time you watch this video, many of them will be answered. One minor reveal is that only M-Series Max and the A17 Pro, as of recording this, are confirmed to support Apple's AI strategy. There are plenty of videos breaking down the features of the Apple intelligence. Still, just as a refresher, they include generative text editing, generative AI for uninspired images and emojis, and one truly dystopian example on the iPad where a stylus sketch is turned into a soulless rendering. More impressive if it actually works are some very impressive natural language interactions and personalized notifications. It's very unclear when and which interactions are on-device, but on-device services likely include dictation and personal context and some of the textual generation, and by that I mean Siri responses. This, of course, will be revealed in the upcoming months. If executed well, it will be the most cohesive and useful AI strategy we've seen from any major company for everyday people, but I expect some growing pains. We should fully expect more emphasis on MPUs moving forward, but companies haven't managed to effectively communicate the value of MPUs or what they do to consumers, and are often cagey even towards developers. This video being case in point. This is certainly not the first time a coprocessor was nebulous to its potential buyers, be it early GPUs or math coprocessors, and if anyone remembers the failed attempt at selling physics processing units for gaming. An interesting aside I noticed while researching this is that CreateML, Apple's tool for training custom machine learning models on Mac OS, which then can be deployed to leverage the neural engine, is curiously not mentioned as part of the chain used to do on-device training. This is likely because the AE is primarily optimized for execution, aka inference, of machine learning. This is evidenced by it only supporting FP16. GPUs and CPUs can execute FP32, which is higher precision, which is needed for many small adjustments from the gradients calculated during backpropagation. CPUs and GPUs can do mixed precision training, where FP16 data can be converted to FP32 when more precision is needed. That is certainly a mouthful, but NPUs and consumer devices are targeted for running existing models as opposed to creating new ones. The a &E is not for AI model creation for developers, at least not today. None of this should come as a surprise. As I stated earlier in this video, typically if you are doing serious ML training, you would have a very expensive GPU setup or least cloud computer time. Apple now provides developers the app's intense framework, which opens up applications for interactions performed by Siri using the personal context awareness and the action capabilities of Apple intelligence. This allows developers to integrate features based on predefined trained models without having to create their own. How useful and widely adopted this is remains to be seen. Also, many AI functions are very RAM intensive. As I demonstrated in a recent video, the limitations of 8GB of RAM in a Mac Mini M1 when it was bested by a Mac Pro 2013. Just maybe, Apple might regret shipping such low RAM configurations. If you want to learn more about memory management in Mac OS, I made a video about it. Links are in the description. Once again, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters for keeping me from running mid-roll ads. If you're looking for another tech deep dive into Apple technologies, check out my video on GPU cores.